Thank you and good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Question number one from Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to assist businesses in the North East that have been affected by changes in global oil prices. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government continues to support both businesses and individuals affected by the downturn in the oil and gas sector. The Energy Jobs Task Force is developing long-term solutions to the structural challenges affecting the oil and gas sector. And our enterprise agencies have engaged with more than 700 companies in the oil and gas industry. In addition to support for, uh, for individuals through the Transition Training Fund, we've also provided a further £12.5 million to support innovation and business resilience, informed by the work of the Energy Jobs Task Force. This included £10 million of Scottish Enterprise funding to help firms reduce risks associated with carrying out research and development. To date, around 78 innovation projects with a total project value value of around £16 million have benefited from around £7 million of Scottish Government support. Uh, £2.5 million was set aside for business resilience reviews, providing targeted support from industry experts, with over £2.5 million committed uh, investment so far. Scottish Enterprise and the Highlands Isles Enterprise are providing practical assistance to the supply chain and have run six resilience in oil and gas events, welcoming 217 delegates from 144 companies to hear from experts on strategy, operations, finance and market resilience. In addition, our competitive business rates package also targets support where it's most needed, capping rates increases for in the region of 1,000 offices in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire as the local area most adversely affected by changes in the oil and gas sector. Councils are able to apply further rates reductions and we continue to work with Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Council uh, to inform this consideration. Gillian Martin. Thank you for that answer. Could the Minister also out outline what he believes to be the key asks of the industry to the UK Government at this time? which will support the considerable work done within the limited powers of the Scottish Government and may also allow companies and the oil and gas workforce to plan for the future. Minister. Uh, well, I, I certainly um, recognise the, 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 the balance between devolved and uh, reserved powers. It's encouraging the Chancellor has finally listened to repeated calls um, from myself and my predecessors on the, uh, in the industry have been repeatedly making for some time to ensure that the right assets are in the right hands. We have seen some recent deals of that nature in terms of transfers from Shell to Chris R uh, and BP uh, to Enquest. But it's crucial uh, that the UK government turns uh, talk into action rather than simply forming further talking shops. So while the panel has been established, we really need it to come forward with concrete proposals that can help the industry. Uh, this week's Oil and Gas UK Business Bulletin highlighted the urgent need for fresh capital investment to stimulate activity and maximise economic recovery. And we believe steps must be now taken to incentivise investment and exploration, which would be of uh, particular help to the supply chain, which is likely to continue to see some tough times ahead. So we're doing everything we can within our devolved powers, as I've outlined in my original answer, but we really need the UK government to step up and stop talking and do something to actually help the industry. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, as well as the Minister for Business and Innovation, have said that business rates raised locally and collected locally stay locally. However, Aberdeenshire Council this morning, councillors were advised that of the £116 million that they expected from business rates next year, they're only getting £93 million from the Scottish Government. Can the Scottish Government tell us where the £23 million has gone? I think the, the member raises an issue. Uh, sorry, presiding officer. Uh, the member raises an issue which is important. But uh, as I stressed in my own uh, attendance at an event in Inverurie, uh, where uh, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Thompson was was present, uh, this is an issue where re revenue is retained by councils, but on a multi-year basis. So uh, I will I ask my colleague Derek Mackay to maybe provide further detail of that mechanism so that it's it's understood by the member and other members in the chamber. Lewis Macdonald. Thank you very much. The minister will know that of the uh, 10,000 businesses in the North East hit by the recent rates revaluation, 8,000 of those have had no benefit from the selective cap that was announced on the 21st February. Will the Scottish Government not now offer some support to businesses such as that owned by my constituents, Graham and Linda Dawson, who have faced not only a 50% increase in their rates uh, uh, liability, but as a result have been taken out of any access whatsoever to the small business rates relief scheme? Or do, was Stuart Spence of the Markle Hotel right when he told this morning's Press and Journal I just don't think they have grasped the problem in Aberdeen. Minister. Well, as, as Lewis MacDonald hopefully knows um, and has been explained in this chamber a number of occasions, individual rates valuations have been set by assessors and Scottish Government ministers do not have any role in setting valuations. But what I would uh, say is that clearly um, any business such as that highlighted with uh, Graham, Graham and Linda Dawson in his constituency would be able to take forward an appeal. Indeed, speaking to uh, uh, the uh, assessor for Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, very keen to engage 
with businesses on an informal basis to see if there's any mistake being made in the valuation and to take forward uh, uh, any changes that could be arising from that. If, of course, uh, the Dawsons are unhappy with the outcome of that, they can still take forward a formal appeal and will have up to six months to do so. So I'd certainly encourage them to, to engage with, uh, with the assessor uh, who seems willing to have detailed discussions about individual businesses on an open book basis to see if there's any unfairness in the valuation that's been arrived at. But we continue to support businesses as best we can with national reliefs and indeed local authorities are taking forward local release as well. Question number two, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason prisoners contesting their convictions are reportedly denied privileges afforded to the wider prison population. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, prisoners contesting their convictions are not denied privilege, privileges afforded to the wider prison population. A system of privileges is in place in every prison in Scotland. Whilst this system may contain different provisions dependent on the security category of prisoners or for prisoners detained in specific parts of the prison, it does not restrict privileges for those contesting their convictions. Alex Cole Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My constituents, Stephen Green and Alan D'Ambrosio, are both serving seven years in HMP Edinburgh. They both maintain their innocence, and I personally find the grounds for their appeal most compelling. They have already suffered unacceptable delays in the appeals process and have been told that they cannot progress to Castle Huntley and the significant privileges that affords while they are contesting their verdicts. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that denying prisoners progression in this way puts unfair pressure on those who might be innocent to abandon their appeals? And what steps does he plan to take to address this? Secretary. Well, President Officer, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to uh, comment on uh, an individual case relating to uh, two of uh, uh, Mr uh, Cole Hamilton's constituents. Uh, these are matters for the courts to determine if any appeal is being pursued. What I can say to the member is that denying the uh, index offence uh, does not automatically exclude an individual from progressing to less secure uh, conditions. However, the Scottish Prison Service uh, must consider the risk of an individual uh, before they consider whether they should move to less secure uh, conditions. Uh, the process for that work being taken forward within the Scottish Prison Service is through the risk management team within an establishment which is responsible for considering whether a prisoner should move to less secure uh, conditions. And where a, an individual uh, denies some or even part of their index offence and that, that restricts their access to being able to participate in any of the uh, behaviour uh, uh, programmes which the SPS operate, then the risk management team can also uh, consider the findings within a psychological risk assessment as well. So it doesn't place a complete uh, provision that prevents them from being able to uh, progress to less secure conditions. However, these matters are considered and decided upon by the risk management team within the establishment. Question number three, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on environmental concerns regarding ac the aquaculture industry production targets. Minister Fergus, Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, presenting officer, aquaculture in Scotland provides world-class products, namely farmed salmon and trout, which have the potential to contribute £3.6 billion annually to the Scottish economy, supporting 18,000 jobs across the supply chain by 2030. The sector supported by the Scottish Government must strive to be a world leader in innovation and demonstrate a global model for sustainable growth. At the same time, however, we need to ensure that there are appropriate measures in place to protect Scotland's water environment from any adverse impacts. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The industry is significant, of course, for employment to fragile coastal communities. And as the industry develops and the Scottish Government consultation, which I understand is about to open, uh, goes live, it is important to consider environmental and welfare issues as well. So will the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary consider welfare assessments into delicing treatments and the success or otherwise of cleaner fish, uh, which is a more environmentally friendly way of dealing with this intractable problem? And as I brought forward in my amendment, uh, which was actually turned down by the Scottish Government to the Aquaculture Act, as it now is, a farm-level assessment uh, for reporting with a delay uh, to give 
uh, companies an opportunity to sort out any problems and to protect their reputation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think in principle that the member raises uh, very reasonable points and ones that we all share. And as I've already said, we need to have in place appropriate measures to protect our water environment. She is quite correct that there is a forthcoming consultation on a new licensing framework uh, and uh, this new framework will seek to help the aquaculture expand, but within sustainable limits. And I'm very pleased also to inform members uh, uh, who may not follow this as avidly as myself that uh, figures published by the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation on the 13th of February show reported sea lice levels during quarter, quarter four were the lowest since 2013, which is very welcome news, but we need to do a, a lot more work, including the, uh, the uh, thorough assessment of all planning applications. And I can assure all members that that is the approach that we take. Tavish Scott. Thank you for starting off. So I hope the Cabinet Secretary might accept that uh, fish farming is one of the most regulated industries uh, in Scotland uh, and uh, needs to be supported uh, through that regulation. Uh, would he, in Claudia Beamish's point, though, accept that the Marine Centre in Scalloway is undertaking field trials into the use of lump sucker fish uh, as a mechanism for dealing with sea lice, which is indeed a grave problem for the industry? Is that the way forward that he foresees for the industry? And will he make sure that his research funds go into supporting that kind of initiative? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to agree with the member, and indeed uh, I was not so long ago in Shetland, and more recently last week in Fort William, and able to speak to people about really the success which fish farming is providing in Scotland for our most rural communities, where there would not really be many other obvious employment alternatives. Uh, and I think uh, Tavi Scott would also agree that salmon is the most climate-friendly food with the lowest carbon footprint of any food, so far as I know, in the world. This is a great Scottish success story and we are determined to write new chapters there and end. Question for Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposed integration of the British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland. Minister Hamza Youssef. Scottish Government's Railway Policing Scotland Bill was published on the 8th of December 2016 with the objective of paving the way of integration of British Transport Police into Police Scotland. Uh, the bill is currently subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, it is the opinion of, amongst others, the rail operators, the rail unions, the travelling public, the BTP Federation, the BTP itself, now even Police Scotland, that this merger is unnecessary and threatens passenger safety. Deputy Chief Constable Hanstock has said, we have not been able to identify any operational or economic benefits. The BTP Federation have said the force is an established and successful model and highlighted an inspection which was so successful, no recommendations were made. Minister, the British Transport Police is not broken. What is the Scottish Government trying to fix? Minister. Well, let me uh, make a couple of observations from the remarks that the member has made. Uh, the first, I'd like to remind the member that, of course, the devolution of British Transport Police is a result of the Smith Commission reached by all parties coming together in consensus. The second point... Oh, they don't like that very much at all. Uh, well, they won't like the second point that I'm going to make either. Uh, that point, of course, is that I was looking through the consultation responses to this very bill that we brought forward, desperately looking to what the alternative is that the Conservatives are proposing. And, presiding officer, I couldn't find any consultation oh. response from the Conservatives oh. whatsoever. Oh. So let me say this. What we're doing with British Transport Police is ensuring it has the same level of accountability as Police Scotland to this Parliament, which, of course, previously it uh, didn't have. And if Mr Kerr, in the, meaning, uh, in the way of being constructive, if Mr Kerr would like to join in the next meeting I have with rail, oper all rail operators, as I did yesterday with ACC Higgins, Police Scotland and the British Transport Police, he is more than welcome because he will find very, very soon that the way he has characterised uh, their views on British Transport Police integration uh, is not their view at all. So in, in terms of being constructive, uh, come forward with proposals of what the alternative may be, but come and have a conversation with the rail operations. You'll find actually uh, that uh, the way he has characterised it is not the way that they view integration at all. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that integration of British Transport Police will mean a more efficient and effective service and it rather uh, then wait on occasion for a considerable period of time for BTP colleagues. Local police officers can be drafted in to deal with crimes on our railway network much more quickly. And 
you know, it was touched on there in, in the previous answer, uh, uh, Minister, but you're not surprised why, if uh, the Tories in this place are so opposed to this, why their colleagues in Westminster were so keen to devolve it? Minister. A couple of observations, of course. The UK government are looking at uh, integration of British Transport Police south of the border with other uh, infrastructure uh, uh, authorities as well. Now, they haven't made an announcement on that, but I assume, of course, the Conservatives uh, on the, in this uh, chamber will be equally vocal in their opposition to that as they seem to be uh, on our plans at the moment. Uh, the second point I would make is that the ACC Higgins at the Justice Committee just on Tuesday uh, gave the absolute assurance that British Transport Police, we know they have expertise and that expertise will be maintained in a railway uh, policing division within Police Scotland. So that expertise that has been gained over many years will be protected. Uh, the funding that goes to British Transport Police protected. Triple lock guarantee in terms of jobs, in terms of pensions and in terms of pay. Uh, and that means, of course, absolutely right, as Kenny Gibson says, that the safety of the commuter, passengers and those that uh, use our railways is paramount in our minds as a government and indeed in the minds of Police Scotland and, of course, the British Transport Police. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's review of GP out-of-hours services. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The out-of-hours primary care system has been facing increasing challenges uh, with pressure of work rising due to significant numbers of people seeking help and due to the lack of available GPs willing to participate in the out-of-hours service. It was with this in mind that we published the report Pulling Together Transforming Urgent Care for the People of Scotland in November 2015, which was led by Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie and followed extensive consultation with stakeholders. The review highlighted the need to think anew about what is best for both urgent care for the people of Scotland and that this would require transformational change across many sectors. The review by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has been undertaken to ensure a safe and sustainable out of our service and we've been assured that the board will be undertaking meaningful engagement with the public to shape its future provision of its out of our service. Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that over the last three weekends there have been no GPs available to cover the out-of-hours service at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Now, whilst I understand that the Health Board is reviewing the service, they have given absolutely no guarantee about operating hours continuing. So will the Cabinet Secretary today guarantee that current evening and weekend services will be fully retained after the review, or will there be cuts at my local hospital? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has advised that the, the closure of the out of our service at the Vale of Leaven <coughs> Hospital on uh, the, the dates that Jackie Bailey uh, referred to was a temporary measure taken to protect patient care due to a staff shortage. The hospital did continue to have medical and nursing staff on site in the minor injury service and patients requiring emergency medical attention were treated by the service. For those who needed a primary care service but deemed not to be in an emergency, transport was offered so that they could be transferred to an alternative out of our service. Now, in, in terms of going forward, obviously the review uh, will be getting underway and I think we need to uh, wait until we see the outcome of that review. Uh, what is clear, however, is that we need a robust, safe and sustainable out of our service available to uh, people, whether that uh, people within Jackie Bailey's uh, constituency or elsewhere within Greater Glasgow and Clyde. We should allow the review to take its course and uh, I will then uh, make sure uh, in uh, discussion with Glasgow and Clyde that that uh, aspiration is delivered. <clears throat> Question number six, Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of ambulance provision in the Murray area. Cabinet Secretary, Sean Robertson. The deployment of ambulance resources is a, an operational matter for the Scottish Ambulance Service. The service continually reviews demand and resourcing throughout the country to ensure that they're delivering a safe and effective service which meets the needs of the people and their communities across Scotland. Douglas Ross. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that last week 95% of ambulance staff who are Unite members supported the call to start official dispute talks with management. Staff have said bosses are clueless and more interested in spin than sorting the service. In Murray, we've had a new ambulance not being used for months because of a lack of driver training and administrative errors, meaning the stock of oxygen in Elgin was so depleted it had to be rationed by ambulance staff because their tanks were in the red. What is the Cabinet Secretary's response to the catalogue of problems in the area and will she agree to meet with me and members of the Scottish Ambulance Service to urgently discuss these issues to ensure local ambulance staff are properly equipped to do the job and the public in Murray get the service they expect and deserve? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I am aware of the issues raised in the north of Scotland and have been in contact with the service to discuss this matter. In fact, I discussed that with the chair of the ambulance service, David uh, Garbutt, uh, uh, just uh, this, this week. Uh, I am reassured that work is ongoing to address the concerns raised and they are, it is very, very important that these concerns are addressed and have been asked to be kept informed of any uh, developments. But I should say that the Scottish Government has invested an extra £11.4 million in the Scottish Ambulance Service and that's helped in the recruitment of 200 additional paramedics this year, 30 of whom will be working in the Grampian area. I would hope that's something that the member would welcome because that's important resources uh, that his constituents will benefit from. Yeah.